Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar today in honor of Food Allergy Awareness Week, which is part of Asthma and Allergy Awareness Month. Today's webinar is being recorded. You will receive a follow-up email with the link to the video afterwards. And please take note that this webinar is of a general nature only and is not medical advice. If you have any questions, you can enter them into your questions box on the GoToWebinar platform that's displaying on your device. At the end of the presentation, we will be doing a Q&A session, and so we'll try to answer as many questions as time allows. My name is Melanie Carver, and I'm the Chief Mission Officer for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. And we have here with us Sanaz Eftakari, our Vice President of Research. And we're joined by Dr. Michael Pissner, who is a pediatric allergist and the Director of the Food Allergy Advocacy, Education and Prevention at the Food Allergy Center of Mass General Hospital for Children. He is also a volunteer for AFA's Medical Scientific Council. And Dr. Pissner is the lead author on the research that we'll be presenting today. Before we get started with the research review, a little bit of background first. Today we'll be talking about food allergies and anaphylaxis. A food allergy is an adverse reaction to an ingested food that is the result of an abnormal immune response. It's triggered by antibodies known as immunoglobulin E, or IgE for short. The symptoms of a food allergy reaction typically involve multiple body systems, including but not limited to your skin, your stomach and gut, and your respiratory systems. And anaphylaxis is a serious allergic reaction that is rapid in onset, and although this rarely happens, it may progress and cause death if not treated promptly. People can be allergic to any food, but the major food allergens in the United States that are responsible for most of the allergic reactions are peanut, tree nut, milk, egg, fish, crustacean shellfish like lobster and crab, wheat, soy, and sesame. And when you break that down by age, the most common food allergies for infants are milk and egg, but you can also see allergies to peanut, tree nut, and wheat and others. In children, the most common are milk, egg, peanut, and tree nuts. And in, adult, in adults, the most common food allergies are peanuts, tree nuts, shellfish, and fish. For over three decades, food allergies have been on the rise in the United States. Peanut allergy tripled between 97 and 08. And recent data showed a 21% increase in peanut allergy since 2010. The current prevalence rate of food allergies in children is 8%, impacting about 5.6 million children. And food allergies are a common cause of anaphylaxis. Over 80% of cases of anaphylaxis in children, um, excuse me, in infants are caused by food allergies. And food allergies are also the most common cause of anaphylaxis-related visits to the ER for children. So why are food allergies on the rise and is there anything we can do about it? We don't know for sure all of the factors that cause the rapid increase in cases, but we know that previous feeding guidelines may have played a big part. 20 years ago, feeding guidelines for infants recommended that parents wait until children were three years old before introducing peanuts or other food allergens into their diet if the family had a risk for developing allergies. Parents adopted these guidelines and the food allergy rates increased. In 2008, the American Academy of Pediatrics in the US and experts in the UK partially reversed these guidelines and acknowledged that there was insufficient data to support delaying introduction of foods. This spurred even more research into the timing of food introductions and the development of food allergies. In 2013, consistent with Canadian guidelines at the time, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology recommended that parents introduce allergenic foods once other complementary foods were tolerated. By 2017, after even more studies were completed, experts in Australia suggested that certain common food allergens should be introduced to infants in the first year of life without screening. And in the US, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases released guidelines saying that peanuts should be introduced depending on the degree of risk and recommended allergy testing first. And most recently in 2020, the guidelines have been updated by the AAP and the USDA to acknowledge that early introduction of peanut helps prevent food allergy and not to delay any specific food after four to six months. 
pre-screening for food allergy is not required, but may be used in some situations. So where does this lead us? Uh, many studies have found the same results. Um, early introduction of foods during infancy helps prevent the development of food allergies. Uh, feeding babies diverse foods between the ages of four to six months teaches their immune system to tolerate the foods. The key points to remember, most national guidelines currently recommend to not delay food introduction in infancy. Exposing infants to eating diverse foods helps reduce the risk of developing food allergies. But there are barriers to early introduction of foods to infants, including uh, despite growing awareness of the new guidelines, uh, only about 37% of infants who are six months of age have been introduced to peanut. Only 60% of physicians provide, are providing recommendations consistent with the current guidelines. And parents encounter other challenges to early introduction, including babies may refuse to eat the foods, uh, you may have worries about adverse reactions, and then there are practical problems like how to prepare the foods, how to get the baby exposed to all of these different ingredients, convenience issues, etc. So most our more healthcare providers and parents need specific information about how to do early introductions and reassurance going forward. So we will cover this topic in more depth in future programming. But for infants who have already developed food allergies, parents and caregivers need to be prepared to treat allergic reactions. So that is what we will focus on uh, for the rest of today's presentation. I'd like to hand it over to Sanaz Eftakari, our Vice President of Research, to talk about our recent study published on anaphylaxis in infants and toddlers. Sanaz? Yep, thanks, Melanie, and hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So I'm going to give a little bit of background on some of the research that we've done um, in partnership with Dr. Mike, who's here on the webinar. Um, yep, thank you. So as many of you know or can imagine, there's definitely unique challenges to recognizing severe allergic reactions and anaphylaxis in younger populations, so in infants and toddlers. And a lot of the current guidelines and uh, diagnostic criteria really are written for a more general population and may not necessarily address some of the needs of the younger population. So for that reason, we've been working with um, Dr. Mike here um, and other leading food allergy researchers to get a sense of what these unique challenges are and um, how parents and caregivers recognize signs and symptoms of allergic reactions in this younger population. Um, the first paper or manuscript from our survey was just published in Jackie. So there's two main goals here, um, and I kind of already touched on this, but just to lay them out here, we really wanted to understand what the symptoms and signs are that um, parents and primary caregivers recognize and see in infants and toddlers during severe food allergic reactions. Um, and this will help us in two ways. One, it would help us um, just educate patients and caregivers and family members generally, but it would also help us kind of bridge the gap between how the medical community speaks to and trains and helps educate the uh, families as well. So the design of our study here is we conducted an online survey um, and it was a pretty um, specific group of people that we wanted to hear from. So these are the criteria that all of the final um, participants in the survey had to meet. They had to be the parent or primary caregiver of a child under the age of five at the time of the survey. And that child must have been diagnosed with a food allergy and have experienced an allergic reaction to that food when under three years old. Um, and that parent or caregiver should, be, should have been present during that specific allergic reaction under the age of three. So with that criteria, um, we had 374 people who completed the survey all the way through, meaning they met these eligibility criteria and finished the survey all the way through. And that breaks down to uh, about half and half, so 193 parents of infants um, and then 181 parents of toddlers. Um, infants for this survey is uh, under one year old, and then we have one to three years old for the toddlers. So in the survey, we asked um, the caregivers about the signs and symptoms they noticed during their child's most uh, severe allergic reaction when under the age of three. And we laid out a bunch of um, potential signs and symptoms categorized into these five systems. So skin, 
respiratory, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, and neurological. And I'm, I'm going to kick it over to um, Dr. Mike to fill, fill you guys in on some of the key findings from the survey. Mike? All right. So we'll start here kind of in a, a broad descriptive manner, and then we'll get into specifics um, after we lay this out for you. So the most common symptoms in general that we found in these infants and toddlers were of the skin and then also swelling. Um, so rash, hives, swelling of the extremities and also face, and also vomiting and diarrhea. Compared to adults and older children, infants and toddlers um, in, in our study were more likely than others um, to have skin and GI-related reactions, but less likely to have issues with respiratory, with breathing, uh, things like coughing and wheezing and shortness of breath. Nearly half of the caregivers that we surveyed said that they recognized signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction in retrospect, but not during the reaction. So what that meant was that at the time it was actually happening, there were some things, uh, some signs and symptoms that the kids were experiencing, but the parents who were there didn't pick up on the fact that those were potentially uh, signs of an allergic reaction. Um, but then once they had the diagnosis and once they learned uh, about managing a kiddo with a food allergy, they looked back on those and remembered the, the reaction. And now they did recognize that those signs and symptoms were part of that kid's allergic reaction. Next slide, please. So, of these signs and symptoms that we picked up in that whole group, the infants and the toddlers, the most common um, in the combined group, as I mentioned, were skin reactions, swelling, vomiting, and diarrhea. Now, although cardiovascular symptoms, like a kid turning blue, um, poor head control, um, weren't as common as some of the others these are still important things to look for and we still were seeing this in um, some of the population but in like other studies um, where cardiovascular symptoms have been reported actually less in the infant toddler population than in older children and adults um, we were picking up on some of this or i should say that our parents who filled out the survey um, while they did see this, it was not as common as the ones that, that we have delineated here, um, where skin reactions and like itching and rash and hives, that was almost everybody, 90%. Swelling of the eyes, lips, tongue, ears, nose, hands, or feet, about 60%. And stomach pain, vomiting, diarrhea, hiccups, spitting up, back arching. Uh, bringing the knees to the chest, these were symptoms in combination um, seen in about half. Uh, coughing and wheezing, not as common as these, but we were actually surprised to see this much in infants and toddlers, about 45%. And then eye rubbing, um, itching and redness, uh, some of these were uh, uh, also seen in a lot of the kids, 44%, and things that not everybody always thinks about. Next slide, please. So as Sanaz was mentioning earlier, part of our design was to match this up with an old AFA study, the Anaphylaxis in America study, which was looking at older children and grown-ups. And what we were able to do is take a look at that and compare it to this one with these younger kids. And our infants and toddlers were more likely to have itching, rash and hives, vomiting, diarrhea, hoarse voice or hoarse cry, and changes in their behavior. While the bigger kids and the grown-ups were more likely to have issues with breathing and also 
throat symptoms. Now, as I mentioned before, some of these symptoms that the primary caregivers recognize in hindsight and looking back, now they realize that these were allergic reactions. The most common were sudden behavioral change, surprisingly skin reactions, gastrointestinal symptoms like vomiting and diarrhea, and then also coughing and wheezing. And almost half would have missed some of these signs and symptoms, um, at least one or more. Now, what we're excited about is that we hope to help make diagnosing anaphylaxis in the infant and toddler a little bit easier. Currently, there are diagnostic criteria that are intended for healthcare providers. Um, and these are the NIAID FAN 2006 Diagnostic Criteria for Anaphylaxis. And as I mentioned, they are created to help a healthcare provider be able to recognize anaphylaxis in their patients. When these were put together, these were put together for all ages. Um, big kids, little kids, grown-ups. They weren't validated in children less than age two, but they were validated in older kids. Now, these again, as I keep saying, are meant for the healthcare provider. And so the terminology and the language used in these is meant for the medical community. One of the things that we wanted to do was also be able to give language that the medical community would be able to then use when training parents and folks in the lay community. And we were also hoping to be able to help with some of the subtle symptoms and signs that an infant or a toddler may show that don't necessarily match up with the symptoms and the signs that a bigger kid or a grown-up would. Now, some of the things that are so clearly different about the age group that we included in our study is that they're nonverbal. Some of the older kids, closer to three, they can they can say some things and they could communicate with their parents but there's no chance that an infant is going to be telling us that they're itchy um, they won't be able to tell us that they have belly pain and so it's not so obvious which would be the signs or the symptoms that would tell us that an infant was experiencing pain in their belly or that they were itchy um, we would be seeing them do things that some parents or doctors may not recognize as signs of an itching mouth. We'll get into some of those details, but what we wanted to do was go after some of the medical terminology and help provide the language for the doctors to then train parents when parents are now given a diagnosis of a food allergy and now doctors want parents to know what to look for. So with that, we'll jump into some of our This, I would say, would be the healthcare provider translation poster. So what we're hoping to do is help with some of these terminology that the medical team may use and what it means for a parent um, and what it means for the parent of an infant. All right, so let's start off with pruritus, which is itchiness. So again, a little baby can't tell us that they're itchy. But what are we going to look for? Next slide, please. Tongue thrusting, tongue pulling, repetitive lip licking, licking hands or objects. I saw a kid lick a chair once. Uh, throat itching, ear pulling, scratching, putting fingers in the ears. Are you station tubes have mast cells, uh, allergy cells that can line them? And if we have early allergic reaction or even later allergic reactions, that can we can perceive that as itchiness. And where a grown-up might be able to tell you exactly what they're feeling, a little kid may just go for their ears. 
eye rubbing, eye itching, these are also things that uh, that will let us know that a kid is itchy. And again, the medical terminology here is pruritus. Next, please. Oh, it's fancy. Dyspnea. Dyspnea is also a term used for shortness of breath, difficulty breathing. And we see some of these terms also, not only in that diagnostic criteria that I was talking about for healthcare providers, but also on some of the traditional action plans that are used, which are also created and meant for all populations. But again, there's a little bit of infant and toddler specificity when you want to be thinking about some of this stuff. So an action plan might say shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, but you're not gonna ask a little baby if they're having difficulty breathing. And the things that you're gonna look for, maybe their belly going up and down, um, their chest rising, you may see the skin kind of suck into their ribs. You also might see something called nasal flaring where their nostrils kind of go out and in. And these can all be signs that a kid is in respiratory distress, that they're working hard to breathe, that they're having dyspnea. Strider, that's the, the medical word for um, <clears throat> the high pitch breathing in. And so someone who's having upper airway swelling may have a hard time breathing and it could make that high pitch sound. We also might then see in an in infant or a toddler, a hoarse cry. So you know the cry of your kid and all of a sudden it sounds like it's really hoarse, like they've been like screaming all day and now when they're crying, it just doesn't sound right, it's kind of raspy. Or um, in the older kid who can vocalize a little bit more, then we have that hoarseness in their voice. Um, and then you can also hear a croup-like cough, which is like a barky, dog sounding um, cough, that can be something that we see in upper airway swelling. Um, and again, it's the inhale that you might hear um, some of these noises with the most. And a kid might also not make much noise or um, uh, have much cough until you piss them off and make them cry. And then when they start crying, then all of a sudden you could see some of these symptoms come. And then when you leave them alone, they kind of chill out. Um, that's something that we see sometimes in the young kids. Next, please. All right, so then on the diagnostic criteria that we showed you before, one of the things that they're looking for is hypotension, low blood pressure. Now, we parents don't have medical equipment in our homes, and it's really hard even for doctors to get an accurate blood pressure on a crying, screaming baby. Um, and babies have an amazing ability to compensate, and their hearts are like really healthy and strong. And so when a kid is having an allergic reaction that involves their cardiovascular symptom or system, most kids, they'll be able to compensate by having their heart beat a little bit faster. But when that happens, they keep their blood pressure up. So if a kid has low blood pressure, then that we would call decompensated shock. Then that's a kid who we've kind of skipped a whole bunch of other cardiovascular symptoms that would have told us that this is a kid who might be having an allergic reaction. And so the reduced blood pressure or hypotension that a healthcare team um, might be going for, uh, they are, there are other things like tachycardia, which is fast heartbeat, that a doctor would be able to use a stethoscope or a nurse would be able to use a stethoscope to be able to tell. Um, other things that we might see um, in a kid would be lethargy. This is extreme tiredness. Now, one of the things just like, let me pause here a second. This would be in the context of a kid who has eaten food who is experiencing an allergic reaction. And now we're seeing these symptoms and signs. And so this wouldn't just be a kid who you wake up in the morning and they're looking tired. We wouldn't call that lethargic in a way that we're worried about it. But if they just ate their allergen and they have hives on their face and now they're floppy and they're limp and they're having a hard time staying awake, this is gonna be a very concerning symptom that is a cardiovascular symptom. 
Um, and so same with poor head control, uh, difficult waking up the kid, extreme crankiness that you can't turn around by taking care of their normal baby needs, right? So your kid is hangry, your kid has a wet diaper. Those are great reasons to be cranky and irritable, but um, they just ate their allergen. They were fine before. They don't have a wet diaper. They have no other reason to be cranky and they're inconsolable and you can't make them feel better. Then maybe they're feeling pretty miserable because they're experiencing an allergic reaction. You can also get kids who might get really quiet and might get really clingy. Uh, so we're looking at these changes in their behavior here that may be associated with cardiovascular symptoms. Um, they could become gray appearing, blue appearing, or their skin can become mottled. That's when you have that kind of lacy look. That can sometimes happen after you get your kid out of a bath. But again, it's about this timing of the allergic trigger plus other signs and symptoms. Um, and then if you got a kid who is very, very quiet, they have hives on their face, they just ate their allergen and now they have this modeling of their skin, then this would be uh, a, another sign that you would use to confirm that yes, this is um, a severe allergic reaction and this could be anaphylaxis. Another medical term that you'll hear is hypotonia. That's that floppiness um, and syncope. This is something that's worked into those diagnostic criteria that I was talking about. This happens to be a kind of challenging thing to, to pick up in a baby, the syncope at least, um, and uh, um, as far as the passing out. And as I mentioned before, you know, having a kid who's lethargic that like can't wake them up, they're not interacting appropriately with you, um, very wobbly appearance, unable to hold up their head, very limp, um, uh, having a hard time waking them up. And then also you can have the inconsolability um, and <clears throat> decrease in activity. Next slide, please. Now, Persistent GI symptoms, persistent gastrointestinal symptoms. These are not the very quick once and done, like a little spit up. This would be um, potentially vomiting, diarrhea. Um, and uh, um, the issue here is, is that if a kid is vomiting, um, then they're also losing fluid. Same with diarrhea. Um, and again, this is in the context of eating your allergen. And now here is a um, kid who is having retching and vomiting. Um, uh, here's a kid who's having a blowout diaper. Uh, these are all things that, that we want to be thinking about in the context of an allergic reaction. More subtle things that we might see in kids might be like if they're just having an early allergic reaction or ate a little bit of their allergen, we might see a kid get hiccups, spitting up back arching, uh, and then it might progress into more significant signs and symptoms like vomiting, diarrhea. And again, the issue of abdominal pain, a six-year-old can tell you that their belly hurts, but an infant isn't going to be able to communicate that. So we might see a kid drawing up their legs, um, crying irritability, um, and uh, um, that again, taken into context with everything else, might tell us that we're having an allergic reaction. Next, please. So, Mike, you just covered a lot of the symptoms to look for. Can we chat a little bit about what parents or caregivers should do in case they do suspect their infant or toddler is having a severe allergic reaction? Yeah. Um, one quick thing to jump to, to just kind of share with you is that of our group, of all those kids who um, uh, were involved in this survey, 41% um, had known food allergy. And so 60% were unknown to have food allergy. And, you know, because we're talking about this infant population, a lot of them were first time allergic reactions. But now what I'll do is I'll talk to you 
as parents of kids with a known food allergy of what you would do in the case that um, your known food allergic child has an allergic reaction. So first off, um, we're hoping that you've already checked in with your primary care doctor and or an allergist, that you were given a diagnosis or a possible presumptive diagnosis of a food allergy. And when that happens, they give you a prescription for an appropriate auto injector. They teach you how to use it. They give you a trainer to practice with. They give you an action plan, which is a cheat sheet that's gonna have a lot of the terminology and language that I just talked about. Um, and then we're gonna want you to get comfortable with this stuff. I'm sorry if I'm overwhelming anybody because that's like a whole lot of stuff that has to happen at that first diagnosis. And then we ask that you practice and you get comfortable with that and you get comfortable with the language and then comfortable enough to train other people. Grandma, grandpa, your wife, your husband, the babysitter, to be able to know what to do in the case of a severe allergic reaction. And so a couple of pointers, and we're gonna get into some of these details and we might have some kind of fun conversations around it, um, are that epinephrine is first line treatment for anaphylaxis. Epinephrine works fast, epinephrine is safe. Um, babies can get epinephrine, there's no reason for anyone who's experiencing a severe allergic reaction not to be treated with epinephrine. Um, and delaying the appropriate treatment of anaphylaxis, which is epinephrine, delaying giving someone epinephrine makes it more likely that you need more support. Um, and so the earlier somebody treats a multi-system reaction, the earlier somebody treats anaphylaxis, with epinephrine, the less likely the symptoms are gonna progress. Um, so you may have, well, one, one thing, and I'll kind of probably have the opportunity to get more into that later, but what helps someone know that it's anaphylaxis obviously is gonna be following your action plan, but severe symptoms, you kind of only need one. You have your allergen trigger, then you have repetitive coughing or wheezing, then treatment with epinephrine following your action plan will be important. Um, it gets easy when it's more than one system. So if your kid has skin findings plus respiratory findings, if your kid has skin findings plus GI findings, then more than one system makes it pretty easy to know that it's time to use the epinephrine and make them feel better fast. Thank you. Can you also chat right. with us about the outcomes of the research? Why did this research matter? So Sanaz so and I were kind of getting at um, some of what this brings to the current field. Um, we're hoping that parents and any community caregivers can increase their own confidence in recognizing severe allergic reactions, even in the youngest kids, even in the kids who are nonverbal. Um, we're hoping to give language to the clinicians to be able to then train families. And then we're also hoping to help pediatricians and allergists recognize some of the less obvious uh, symptoms and signs when evaluating young kids. So us allergists do food challenges, um, and we're also helping talk to people about what to be thinking about and also getting histories from families. So it's really great if allergists are very comfortable with recognizing some of these less common findings in this nonverbal population and the pediatricians who are covering urgent cares and emergency departments, they're all gonna need to recognize some of these signs and symptoms also. Uh, and then we're hoping that the language that we identified in this survey could potentially be used for developing action plans that have some infant and toddler specificity and potentially help with uh, future clinical guidelines and uh, modifications and diagnostic criteria. 
Okay, thank you. We're now gonna jump into the Q&A session. Uh, we received a lot of questions from parents and caregivers, um, as well as others who have joined us. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into the first one. So the new guidelines say to introduce peanut foods, but my first child has peanut allergies. I'm nervous to feed peanut foods to my baby. So Dr. Mike, I think there's a lot to unpack here uh, because there can be different factors that can be feeding into this. All right, so the first thing that we're finding is, is that with these early introductions, the symptoms that a kid has been experiencing in some of the studies and also now the experiences of the um, allergy community is that it seems that some of these reactions at these first introductions actually aren't quite as severe as when the kids become older. And uh, one of the studies that Melanie mentioned earlier, the LEAP study, learning early about peanut, that's exactly what they found in theirs. That when their subjects, when the kids that were doing early introduction when they were young, less than um, age one, when they had reactions, they were significantly less severe than when the children had reactions when they were five years old. Um, and so it is reassuring that it does seem, and that is a trend that holds in other studies as well, that some of these younger kids tend to have less severe reactions. That's the first thing. Um, another is that uh, Corinne Keat has recently done a study, and uh, um, I was lucky enough to collaborate with her on that, uh, as well as uh, many other people on our team. Um, and she found that having a sibling or a parent with a peanut allergy doesn't really significantly increase the chance that the young baby that we're about to feed is going to have a peanut allergy. And so it was really reassuring because family history really didn't seem to add much risk at all. Uh, and delays in introducing the peanut, so in the case of a kid with moderate or severe eczema in that study, uh, every month after six months where the introduction was delayed increased the odds of developing a peanut allergy by 30%. And so therefore, in someone whose big brother, big sister, mom or dad has a peanut allergy, and the family is thinking about early introduction, the sooner they actually introduce in that kid, the better. And if the child has other risk factors like having moderate or severe eczema, then talking to the doctor and figuring out how is the safest approach, but keeping in mind that we do not want to delay things, that doing it before six months is going to be pretty important. Um, and so all of those things for me are reassuring. So I would hope that in answering the question for the family who's a little nervous about feeding their peanut foods to the baby, that I hope that I just kind of laid out some reassuring things. So now as Melanie, how'd I do? Yeah, I think I think that is reassuring. I think families might still encounter practical concerns. So could you maybe give a few tips on how you might introduce peanut in a situation where maybe you didn't have peanut butter in the house because of the first child who is allergic? Got um, it. All right. People, so that's people might be tip. nervous about the baby spit up yeah. or teething on toys right. and things like that. Okay. So if the baby spits in the mouth of the older sibling, then you know that's uh, something that we don't want to happen. And so uh, no fooling around. Um, then obviously cross contact is something that we'll want to think about in the opposite, right? So now we reassured the parents of the, the baby and now let's reassure the same parents of the bigger kid. So we want to be mindful of not having cross contact for the older sibling. And so, you know, if like big brother's a goofball and takes the binky after the baby just had peanut and puts it in his mouth, that's gonna be something we're not gonna want to happen. Some families may choose not to have the, the, the peanut in any room other than the kitchen, having it in a place where they can easily clean it and um, not make accidental, um, uh, 
having the food in a place where the big kid can grab. Some families choose not to have it in the house, but then give it to the kid when they're in their stroller, out of the house, at another caregiver's home. Um, it really is going to be up to the families coming up with a reasonable plan that works for the way they work, the number of children, and the rooms in their house, and the way they like to clean stuff. Um, and using the dishwasher works well. Um, you wouldn't want to use the same sponge to clean any of the peanut items of baby for then like the sippy cup of the big brother or sister. Um, some families have found using some of the pouches that have peanut containing food in them might be a clean, easy way uh, that they don't need to do much food prep or, or uh, um, uh, getting crumbs anywhere. Uh, and thinking about the type of peanut food that they're giving the baby, where you might have options of a peanut powder, which can um, be a powder consistency. There's also Bombo, which are these um, peanut puffs. They happen to be totally messy and get all over the place. And so the powder and the puffs might be more challenging to clean, where using something that may be less um, uh, annoying to clean could be something that a, a family might want to go with. OK, thank you. I think those were very helpful tips. We have another question. I introduced peanut butter to my baby when he was 11 months old and he still got a peanut allergy and it has only gotten worse. Will he ever outgrow it? I think a lot of parents do, you know, have those thoughts about how long will my child be managing this allergy, et cetera. So can you comment on this? Yeah, so what we have been finding is, is that unlike milk, egg, wheat, uh, kids with peanut allergy, and then also tree nut allergies and sesame, they tend to be the ones to keep it. Where some of the, the data about the chance of outgrowing an allergy, about 80% keep it for peanut. But with some of these very young kids being identified, um, there are some opportunities to give them some of the best chance of outgrowing it, where one going theory about the development of food allergies now, um, and there's uh, many, many groups are working on trying to wrap our heads around it, and, and, and if there are any meaningful things that we can do to make recommendations as far as prevention of development of food allergies, is this dual exposure hypothesis where the current thinking is, is that the skin is likely the sensitizing root, is the skin is where if you have routine exposures to a food, especially if a kid has eczema, especially if it's angry and inflamed, and the barrier function of the skin isn't so great, and you're coming in contact with, let's say, your parents' peanut butter that is getting on your skin, and maybe your parents are putting creams on you, and again and again and again, you're having these exposures, that might be a sensitizing exposure. That might increase the chance that a kid might develop an allergy to that food. Alternatively, the tolerizing, so the dual exposure hypothesis is the skin is the sensitizing root. I just talked about that. But then the gut, orally eating a food, if you haven't already developed a food allergy, Early introduction might be protective. So the immune system of the gut may chill things out, may tolerize things. So if a kid hasn't already developed their peanut allergy and they have this early introduction and they keep it in routinely, then that is likely protective. So you got this balance between the skin as the sensitizing root and the gut as the tolerizing root. Now, if you have a kid who now already has a peanut allergy, then this is where trying to limit the skin exposure to that kid may make a difference in whether or not they outgrow it. 
So if a child who now has a known peanut allergy, if their mom, dad, brother, sister, dog, they're all munching on peanut all over the place, and this kid is getting peanut powder mashing in their skin for the next three or four years, that kid might become more and more allergic. So in a kid who already has a known peanut allergy, trying to decrease some of those um, routine skin exposures may be helpful. All right, Mike, I'm gonna jump in. Um, we're trying so hard to keep up with all these great questions coming in through the chat. Um, so I know we have a few more on the slides for you, but I'm gonna throw a curveball at you with a live question coming in. So um, we have someone asking about whether breastfed newborns or infants could potentially have an allergic reaction to a food the mother has eaten. And a quick time check, we've got a little over 10 minutes left. All right, um, I'm gonna go on uh, rapid fire. Uh, so there, there has been um, some, some studies do show that you can have milk, you can have egg that is detectable that can come across the breast milk. Sometimes somebody might feed, um, and, and other things, um, somebody might feed and sometimes allergen might not go across, but somebody might feed and sometimes allergen will go across. So there are going to be some babies that have reacted um, to the food that their mom eats. Um, that's a thing. Uh, there are some kids who can have really challenging to manage um, uh, uh, skin findings, and then ultimately, when their um, that exposure is dropped, then it goes away. Um, this is a conversation that would be important to have with your healthcare provider, especially with your allergist. Is if you have a baby or a child who you're nursing and they have an allergy to let's say peanut, then the question then would be, is it wise for a nursing mom to then consume that allergen? There have been cases where the kids can have reactions from it. It's a little bit unpredictable. Um, some allergists, uh, may give different answers about those circumstances. Um, I particularly try to get the um, perspective of the family. We all talk together, um, but I do find that it can be a little bit challenging um, to keep allergen, the specific allergen in. Um, and so um, I, I, might recognize or I might recommend avoiding the particular known allergens because of a little bit of the uncertainty. And then also um, with that small willy-nilly exposure, it's still unclear whether that might be further sensitizing um, or if it's helpful. All right. Thanks, Mike. And, and a reminder, we're just talking pretty general in nature here. And I'm going to reiterate what you just said is really working closely with um, your own primary care or um, uh, allergist or pediatrician. All right, Mel. So back to the symptoms that you were walking through earlier, Dr. Pissner, um, it can be pretty challenging in identifying these in infants. So can you chat with us again about what are the what are the tips for determining the difference between an allergic reaction and, and expected behavior uh, right. from infants? Like if they're teething, they're gonna be cranky and drooling and pulling at their mouth. So what should parents look for? But one, of, one of the helpful things is knowing, um, you know, if there was a known and clear allergic trigger, um, that is one of the things um, to be aware of. Um, in the case of a kid who just now is drooling and pulling at their mouth, um, then, you know, our kids, even our kids who have food allergies, act like babies and act like normal kids. So being able to um, uh, first know that they didn't have an obvious and clear exposure and then be able to know that, you know, if they're just teething, they're not going to have hives also. If they're just teething, they're not going to puke, um, and then um, and then have their own symptoms just around what you would expect from normal teething. So looking at patterns, uh, looking at other signs and symptoms, 
uh, looking at that potential trigger, uh, and then also looking at their, their behavior um, and if the things that you would do to take care of these normal behaviors like crying from a wet diaper, um, uh, if changing their diaper works, then that's great, then that's very helpful to know. But if doing the things that you normally would do don't work, um, then keeping in mind that, you know, what are the other um, signs and symptoms to look for and are they there? No, then um, uh, that can be very helpful taking all of those into consideration. Okay, and I think the next one is very um, relatable because babies, you know, can be displaying different symptoms and, you know, it may get dismissed as just being a fussy baby or, or having colic. So at what point should it prompt you to uh, take your baby to your provider and ask about food allergies? Well, if you have these repeat exposures that keep bringing um, these uh, signs and symptoms, then um, that'll be something definitely worth talking about. Uh, like I said before, if you uh, um, have ruled out all the normal baby things, then um, that'll be more concerning and talking to your healthcare provider will be important there. Okay. Next question we have, um, we've, we've actually received this question on our community a few times from parents who have multiple children and not knowing what to do if the second child has signs of anaphylaxis be like for the first time reaction. Uh, how should they proceed? Well, first I'd say, if this is a concern of yours and you're kind of thinking about it, have this conversation with your primary care doctor. So um, before you guys change any of your um, medical, uh, kind of the way you treat your kids, talk to your primary care doctor. Um, and uh, um, But I'll tell you a couple reassuring things. So. Um, currently, there's an available 0 0.1 um, milligram dose of epinephrine, which for infants is a very infant-appropriate dose. But now, before that 0 0.1 milligram dose was available, um, all that was available was the 0 0.15, um, which likely that bigger kid that you guys are talking about um, that was what was routinely being used to treat anaphylaxis in the lighter kids. Um, and uh, when that is the available dose, it works. The issue is that the needle length of the 0.15s uh, is a little bit longer than the 0.1s. Um, and uh, um, to compensate for that, bunching up the child's muscle so the place where we're putting the epinephrine um, is halfway between the knee and the hip in the medius part of the outer thigh. And so bunching up the actual muscle kind of away from the bone and then giving that dose of the auto injector um, and not very strongly slamming it into the child's leg, but finding that sweet spot and then pressing with your gentle pressure. One, two, three. And then we have all the different sorts that do it, but bunching up that muscle and then giving gentle pressure as opposed to a very long, large or strong jab um, would decrease the chance of trauma and decrease that that longer needle would go uh, and and bonk the bone. So now, as a Melanie, did I approach that well enough? Do you guys have any extra questions about that for clarity? I I do not. So Naz, do you have any to add? I know you're keeping an eye on the chat from the audience. Um, there's so many questions coming in on the chat, and I know we're running short on time, so we might have to do a part two of this, Dr. Mike. <laughs> um, and, oh, man. Um, but no, I, I think you addressed this. I think the question is people just want to know if there's, um, when they're hesitating, should they use available epinephrine? And it sounds like the answer is 
yes, if, if, if you do believe it is anaphylaxis and are seeing some severe symptoms. Epinephrine is symptoms. the treatment of choice for anaphylaxis. And if a kid is having anaphylaxis, epinephrine will make them feel better real fast. Okay. Um, okay. I know we have a few more on the slides, but I'm going to feed you one more from the live chat. Are delayed reactions common? So things like hives, um, are they common, common to come after the actual uh, introduction to the trigger? Got it. So the majority of IgE-mediated allergic reactions, those are the allergic reactions that are involving those like mast cells and basophils, our allergy cells that have the IgE to the food. That's IgE is what the allergist tests for in a skin test or a blood test. The majority of those types of reactions that can potentially go on to cause anaphylaxis, those minutes to under a couple of hours, the majority of the allergic reactions are going to happen in that period of time. Things that delay our gastric emptying, like a huge meal, high fat meal, those could make some reactions happen a little later. Some kids, like the egg allergic kids or milk allergic kids, who might consume a muffin, sometimes the baked in egg or the baked in milk might cause reactions that are a little bit delayed compared to the kid who had scrambled eggs um, or straight milk. Uh, so we might see a faster reaction with straight forms and a slower reaction with baked forms in those cases. Um, but then there's non-IgE mediated reactions like milk or soy proctocolitis where we have blood in the stool and it's limited to the gut. We also have things like FPIs, food protein induced enterocolitis. That could take a couple hours um, to kick in. That could take two hours for vomiting and maybe diarrhea, four to six hours, um, but the proctocolitis can take much longer. So those IgE ones faster, the non-IgE ones slower. And so um, hopefully I've addressed that one. Yep, um, we're gonna squeeze in one last one, Mel, if you wanna go to the slide, the next slide, and then maybe close out. Oh, nope. I had already advanced to uh, wrapping up. <laughs> okay. so, so we're going to wrap up. Um, we got a bunch of these questions that you guys have submitted when registering for the webinar, but also during this webinar live right now. Um, so we'll make sure to look those over and um, figure out if we're going to host a second one or address some of these questions and, and other educational materials that we put out. But circling back to AFA's research uh, work, um, we do focus on patient-centered research. That means that we want to be partnering with you guys, the, the parents, the caregivers, the families, the community members on the ground who are experiencing these things. Um, and so you'll hear a lot from AFA about opportunities to get involved in research, and we would really welcome and appreciate um, any participation from our community. Um, and this helps us give a stronger patient and caregiver voice to the research that's happening, so that not all of this stuff is happening in the background without the involvement of the people who are really impacted by food allergies and anaphylaxis. Um, so here you'll see links to our online communities. Um, if you join these communities, uh, it's free to join and you'll stay up to date on these opportunities as they come out. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Pesner, we really appreciate your time and expertise and thank you for presenting this critical research today and we have more to come. Uh, we do invite everyone to check out the Kids with Food Allergies website. There are a lot of resources available to help you manage food allergies and, and help uh, keep your child safe, healthy, and included. Um, and we will also uh, you know, attempt to address all of the questions that have come in. We can find other ways to help answer them, either through our blogs or with follow-up webinars. Thank you all for joining us today. Please take the webinar satisfaction survey when you exit. We take your feedback seriously to help improve our programming. And have a wonderful rest of the week. And thank you for helping us to raise food allergy awareness.